Welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. This week, we welcome Dr. Michael Osterholm, renowned pandemic expert and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter. The clock is ticking as President Biden prepares to officially end the COVID public health emergency. And our guest has been in meetings at the White House in recent days to sort out what this will mean in real terms, and you're about to hear his answers. Michael Osterholm earned his PhD from the University of Minnesota, where he now leads the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Well, Michael, welcome back to Conversations on Healthcare. Thank you, good to be with you. Yeah, it's good to see you. And, and you know, as you know, you s served on President Biden's COVID advisory board, and the administration has really made a big decision to end the public health uh, emergency uh, probably about three months out in your White House meeting included a focus in on testing. And we know you think ending the public health emergency is troublesome. What has been your advice to the president's team? Well, Mark, I think one of the things that's important to understand is there's a whole series of different actions that have been taken over the course of the pandemic to either enhance our public health response or make resources available. So it's not just the public health emergency, but there's actually a federal emergency. There's the PREP Act. There was actually the Stafford Act. And even FDA had its own authorities on emergency use of various drugs and vaccines. And so all of these are somewhat overlapping. And I think the, what we're talking about is the public health emergency going away in May. And actually that one may not be as onerous as many people think in terms of what it means. The one that um, actually I think has attracted a lot of attention has been the one that we may be taking a number of people off the Medicaid rolls that were kept on during the pandemic. As you know, um, Medicaid's uh, uh, operations go through and continuously check for eligibility for people to be on Medicaid, and if they shouldn't be, then they are moved off. And the, there's been estimates, uh, wide ranging estimates, how many people have stayed on through the pandemic that shouldn't be on that will fall off. Now, the point about that one, though, is that the ominous bill was passed in December, already delinked those two before the public health emergency action were even to be taken. So this is not a new action by the public health emergency. If you look at the tools we have, the antigen test, uh, and so forth. Uh, the big challenge there really is not so much about the emergency, but it's about whether Congress will continue to fund making these available. Remember that at this point, companies are not just gonna make a lot of antigen tests that's not already purchased because of the outdating of these and the loss that they would have of revenue if they don't make it. So we're trying to still work it out, but right now the US Postal Service program for testing still has a substantial amount of antigen testing there, but yes, it'll eventually run out. And whether Congress comes back and deals with that or not, that's a challenge. Same thing is true with vaccines. Right now we have quite a bit of vaccine, um, uh, but we'll need resources in the future. So the emergency in of itself doesn't change that. If Congress is not gonna support purchasing more, then it will go to the private sector. The private sector then will have its choice of how they wanna sell it. We've already heard companies like Pfizer will charge up to $130 a dose. On the other hand, healthcare coverage for about 92% of the country uh, will require as part of standards uh, benefits that you have to get the vaccine and pay for it as an insurance issue. So we'll have about 8% of the public that won't be eligible. And then the final piece is the drugs, the Paxlovid. Uh, right now we have lots of Paxlovid. We should be fine for some time dispensing that. The challenge again is we need to develop new and better drugs. We need to continue to fill in behind Paxlovid comes back to Congress, so they appropriate the money. So I think that this May date uh, for relieving the public health emergency is not quite what people think as if it's a light switch on and off. There's a lot of other complexities among them. The FDA uh, authorities over emergency use authorization will stay at FDA. Uh, all the issues around the PREP Act we've dealt with will stay. All the Stafford Act and how FEMA funds and doesn't fund will stay. So, so it really is more limited impact than I think most people realize. Margaret, I think uh, uh, Michael hits the right note of concern that we have is certainly on the Medicaid redetermination, which could be 10 or 15 million people, and also that 8% of the population for whom uh, many of those who are listening today are part of a network that serves that population. I think both of those are big concerns for us. 
Well, and they are for me too. And they are for me. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And the, the good news is we've seen it coming and there's uh, plans in place, but we know uh, that that 8%, uh, as you say, is concentrated in community health centers and in public health clinics. And we need to have all the resources we've had around Paxlovid, around vaccines, around testing. Uh, to care for people. Uh, and as always, Michael, I really appreciate the broad kind of 360 view you take uh, of these issues uh, when responding to questions. But I uh, was thinking, listening uh, to one of the World Health Organization uh, leaders, how much words matter. And uh, the comment was that the acute phase of the pandemic uh, is ending. Now, maybe everybody doesn't listen to these the same way. I think, well, if acute is ending, then it's not like we're in, you know, end of pandemic, we're in a chronic endemic uh, kind of phase. I think most experts uh, like yourself kind of hedge their bets on predicting COVID's future path. What, what does it mean in practical terms when the World Health Organization says the acute phase is ending? Well, Margaret, let me just say that I found myself in the very uncomfortable position several months ago in a New York Times story, several lines below the president having declared the pandemic is over, me saying it's not. Uh, you know, you never want to be in that position. It's not a good place to be. Yeah. But what I did do is reinforce that what the president was saying is that for most of the public, the pandemic is over. They see it as such. Uh, and so that's a concern. But if you look for the last 10 months, we have been somewhere between 380, often 400, to 550 deaths a day. And it just hasn't changed. It's right. look at it today. We're at 460 deaths right. again today. And so we've been in this high plains plateau of cases for the past year. If you want to get some sense of the importance of that number, just remember that the number one cause of cancer deaths every day in this country is lung cancer. And that's about 350 a day. So, I mean, this is still a very significant impact issue, and yet the public is done with it. Uh, when we look at the fact that we have clear and compelling data, in fact, the CDC has just released new data this week, supporting how effective the bivalent vaccine is among those over age 65 in preventing serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. You have a 14 times higher risk of dying from COVID if you're not vaccinated versus having the bivalent and even five times higher risk if you've been vaccinated but didn't get the bivalent. And yet only 40% of the US population over age 65 have gotten the bivalent booster. That is different than you know getting the vaccine to the people, it's getting that last inch, getting the vaccine in the arm. And so I think we have a huge challenge yet to say that you know we're not at the level we might wanna be and we surely don't know what the virus is going to throw at us next. And so I think from that standpoint, uh, I would like to think maybe we're in close to an end of a pandemic kind of time, but I don't think that we can say that at all yet. Well, you know, it's such the, the numbers are so discouraging. It has a, asking me a question about the public health uh, community and whether or not they're tone deaf in terms of the type of information we need to provide people or they have been so politicalized uh, that uh, Americans have turned turned a deaf ear to them, and uh, all of that is problematic. But I, I do want to talk about, speaking of ears, uh, you and others have the administration's ears, uh, and publicly warned a few months ago that you uh, we've not done enough to prepare for the next pandemic. And your piece in the New York Times even called for uh, a mandating a national indoor air quality standard. Margaret, we had... Uh, uh, maybe six months ago, uh, Dr. Joseph Allen from Harvard on, right. who's really the guru in this area, somebody we really enjoyed having a conversation, really talking about the importance. So Michael, I'm so glad you stressed that. There's a new uh, uh, chief of staff at the White House, somebody you're probably familiar with, uh, to <laughs> President Biden, uh, Jeff Zients. Um, if there was anybody who would have a receptive ear about making the case for these air quality standards, I think it would be uh, Jeff Science, but I know uh, there are a lot of priorities. Um, but what, what's your take on the, uh, the message you have for the chief of staff, or, or is he pretty well informed at this point? But talk a little bit about this air quality, because I, I do think yeah. in this whole notion of moving people back to work, uh, this air quality standard is really going to be high on their mind. Well, Mark, I think uh, this is an incredibly important point, not just for now, but for moving to the future. And let me just say I have had the wonderful gift of having uh, Ron Klain as a dear friend and Jeff 
and having worked closely with Jeff uh, on the days of the transition team, and I think very highly of both of them, very highly. Um, let me just put into context what we're talking about. Most people might think that we want to talk about indoor air standards for the current pandemic. And I think, you know, we're beyond that. You know, what I mean by that is any kind of real efforts to deal with indoor air and changing and improving ventilation is an infrastructure concept. And we've already learned just how far behind we are in infrastructure in this country and roads, bridges, et cetera. Well, indoor air is one of them that has not really been addressed. And what we need to do is address it for the future. I mean, let me just put this in context. I know people never want to hear this, and they surely might label me as an alarmist. But, you know, what we're doing right now with the, this pandemic, this is not the big one. This isn't. The big one is a coronavirus pandemic that has the transmission potential of SARS-CoV-2 very high and has the ability to kill like MERS and SARS, where anywhere from 15 to 35 percent of the people died, not less than 1 percent. Or think about, again, influenza, which we're going to have more influenza pandemic. Remember, in 1918, influenza killed 100 million people in two years in this country, mm -hmm. at a time when the population was one-fourth what it is today. And modern medicine wouldn't necessarily save a lot of these people as they died acutely with this uh, fulminating illness. And so we have to understand that as bad as this has been, we have to be better, better prepared for the future. And so clearly, air quality and how we can reduce the transmission by having better air exchanges, uh, abilities to inactivate uh, viruses, for example, in the air, is an investment that is so, so important. This is one of those ones, you know, when I was a young kid growing up, there was an old uh, commercial on TV, the oil fram commercial that said, you can pay me now or you'll pay me later. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to experience that. So we have to keep pushing this. And I know the administration is obviously very sensitive to infrastructure. They have been. But now how do we help buildings be healthier? How do we help transportation be healthier that way? And we have a lot of work yet to do around that. Well, we couldn't agree with you more. And I think even in the setting of healthcare from the perspective of primary care, the standards and the requirements for facilities, they're just not strong enough. You have a negative air pressure room in a facility. Yeah. What good does that do you if you end up in the wrong room and find out what the patient's issues are? So thank you so much for shedding light on that. Uh, I want to talk to uh, uh, an issue that's you know part promising and part concerning. Uh, promising a new interferon drug in development that is reported to cut in half of COVID patients' odds of hospitalization. Uh, but you've already sounded the alarm, and you noted this, I think, a few minutes ago, uh, that we're not even getting Paxlovid to enough patients who need it and still have, as you said, uh, somewhere around 450 Americans dying each day from COVID. So even if the FDA approves new drug treatments, uh, we're going to have this issue of making sure they get to the patients uh, mm -hmm. who need them. And I guess my question to you is from uh, talking uh, to all of your colleagues, uh, is it prescribers not really being serious about the recommendation and the prescribing, or is it patients saying, no, don't believe it, don't want it? What are you hearing? Well, Margaret, again, you framed a very, very important issue, not just for this pandemic, but going forward. Um, let me use an analogy that uh, I did a podcast on, on my weekly podcast back in November of 2021, just as the vaccines were beginning to, 2020, as the vaccines were beginning to roll out. And the title of the, pan, of the podcast was The Last Mile, The Last Inch. The last mile was actually getting, the, in this case, vaccines. You could just substitute the word drug. And then the last inch was getting it in their arm. Or in this case, well, how do you get the consumer to actually take the drug? Let's start to take the big picture first. I'm extremely concerned that we are now watching investments in any kind of aspects of somehow related to the pandemic drying up quickly. People want to move on. It's as much a psychological issue as it is an economic issue. And we're watching companies right now that have potentially very, very important new products to bring to market that are shelving them because there's no financial model for them. If the government doesn't buy it and give you a guaranteed price on it, financially, it just isn't worth their while to do it because you have to wait till the next pandemic or will the consumer use it. We're missing golden opportunities there to bring forward new technologies. And we need to have that, and we don't. And that's not just true in the US, that's around the world. The second thing is, is even if you have that technology, the question is, how does it get used? Just as you pointed out, the Paxlovid experience has been, frankly, a disaster from my perspective. 
Look at the VA study that showed only 4% of eligible patients there were actually prescribed Paxlovid when in fact they knew that they should get it. I was actually involved in a situation where several of my friends and colleagues who were VA pa uh, patients who developed COVID, who had in fact uh, all the risk factors for get needing the drug and who were in, within the time frame of getting the drug, but were turned down. And it turned out that the VA had sent out a statement that were used by the nurse line to say, you only need Paxlovid if you're in the hospital and severely ill, which is already way too late and you're not eligible anymore. It was a mistake. And we have seen so much misinformation. There's the information about Paxlovid rebounds. Well, there's been several studies now that show rebounds are common, whether they're Paxlovid related mm -hmm. or not. And so here we are now having this misinformation. Well, you don't want to get this drug because you'll have a rebound with it. Well, you know, that's not true. And so I think that we have challenges about information systems to physicians so that they can have a better sense of what they can do. And the data are clear and compelling. Paxlovid will reduce serious illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. And Paxlovid has even been able to demonstrate a reduction in long COVID development. So I think we have to go back and look at how do we communicate this information? How does every practitioner out there know and understand? And finally, I just have to tell you an anecdotal story that involved me that I thought was telling. So I led a delegation uh, last summer to Cuba <clears throat> to look at their COVID vaccines. They actually have a uh, unique technology, conjugated vaccine that is really quite exciting. And so I have not yet had COVID and I wear faithfully with my N95. Well, I contacted my primary care doctor's office and said, could I get a script for Paxlovid now? I won't take it unless I actually have a lateral flow positive test while I'm in Cuba. And they said, no, we can't. But if you send us a picture online of your test result while you're in Cuba, we'll email you a script. <laughs> and I said, well, that's going to do no good. There is no Paxlovid in Cuba. Well, that's all we can do. Well, I finally had to go through the healthcare system myself, knowing who I am, and actually was able to get through to the person that could say, well, I'll, I'll write you one, okay? But the average citizen would have been right. funding from getting that. Right. And right. that's what we have to address. That's just wrong. And uh, people have died unnecessarily yeah. because they were unable to get Paxlovid when they could have and should have gotten it. You know, uh, as you know, you've been working on a roadmap for a better coronavirus. So important. You know, I was just thinking over the last 20 years, SARS, MERS, covid 19. I'm wondering, as you think about the vaccine, uh, will we get a vaccine that prevents infection? Um, wh where, where do we stand on all, all that? And maybe give us a, a preview of wh what we can expect uh, from the report that you're uh, about to yeah. release soon. Well, thank you, Mark. And in fact, yes, this is, report's coming out in just a little over uh, two weeks. And uh, it is a, a year long project which involved uh, more than 60 of the world's leading experts on all aspects of, of coronaviruses, vaccines, immunology, et cetera. And this roadmap, like the one we did for influenza, is extremely detailed. It's over 70 pages long, and it gets down to measurable outcomes, when we should have achieved these outcomes, by what date, and everything from you know, something as simple as what is a correlative protection? for a coronavirus vaccine to what do we know or not know. And what my concern is here, again, is when we look at funding, I don't see any major initiatives right now that have identified funds that will say, this is gonna take a while, but we gotta stay on it. And even if the pandemic quote unquote goes away, it's not time to say we're done because we don't know if we're gonna have that big one I just talked about a moment ago where in fact it is a SARS-MERS, SARS-CoV-2 mixture that could be much worse than we have now. And so I think this roadmap will be very instructive. It will provide us with you know, granular detail about what needs to be done in sequence and how we do it. Uh, the challenge is gonna be who's gonna support it. If you look at the federal government right now, the resources just aren't there. If you look at Europe, uh, Asia, we just don't see it. So. This is not the time to have pandemic amnesia. This is the time to have pandemic planning front and center. Michael, you've got the Gates Foundation, Rockefeller along with that, but what, what's, the, what's the bread box or elephant size that's needed for this type of investment? Well, I think the challenge we have right now is it's, uh, we're not really part of that other than just keeping track of it. We plan on being air traffic controls to understand 
just as we do again with influenza, who's investing what, when, and where so that we know if we have underinvested areas. The challenge is going to be likely in the billions of dollars ultimately to bring a new vaccine like this to, to fruition. But the bottom line is, is that that billions could save trillions and trillions of dollars and many millions of lives. And so, you know, I think one of the things we've learned, if nothing else in this pandemic, and both of you know this, I talked about this in my 2017 book, Deadliest Enemies, that the cost of a pandemic is not just in human lives. It's economic, too. And when you look at the global uh, economic crisis of the last several years and the inflation issues, this was all caused by the pandemic. Right. And the one thing that added, of course, was the war uh, that we've seen in Ukraine. But that has a late comer and minimal. Now, when you look at the cost globally, what this pandemic has, has done to us, and you look at what the investment could be to take that off the table, I mean, talk about high quality insurance. This is it. And so we've got to help the world understand, don't let up now. Help us get the kind of vaccines that next time that one of these viruses emerges, we will be able to act quickly, effectively, and then we cannot have just a vaccine that reduces severe illness, hospitalization, and death, but a vaccine that also prevents infection and That's transmission. Okay. Wow, what a gift to the world that would be. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I, I uh, have to make the point as well uh, that as important as it is to have that vaccine on the shelves, there was a level of training, recruitment, deployment of frontline staff to manage that uh, vaccine train, right? The, the refrigeration chain, get it out to where people are, give the vaccines that we can't let that workforce kind of tone down their readiness and preparedness because it was not easy to stand it up around the country. We need to make sure we keep those skills really crisp. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more, there. Margaret. And I use the analogy, imagine if every year Major League Baseball teams fired everybody after the <laughs> right. World Series and then tried to go hire them again in March if they could. Right. Okay. And exactly. we must be talking yeah. about the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, there you no, go. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that expertise to you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, me as well. I don't do sports analogies. But, yeah. but Michael, uh, you know, we we talked about uh, the time uh, using this time now wisely, the report, uh, the implementation, being ready. Uh, I'm just not sure we're going to have a long lead time. There's so much going on. And I wonder if you could just speak to this outbreak uh, at a Spanish mink farm and bird flu that's proven to be so deadly yeah. in the past. You, you just told us, you know, do not take this for granted. What's the current status of that? I know, you know, people are overwhelmed sometime with this news, but it's important for people to understand. So current status of that threat and what can people do to protect ourselves? Well, let me just take a step back and tell you, I've been dealing with this uh, H5N1 issue since 1997 and its emergence in Hong Kong. And I've been very involved with it. I've been in Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam working on H5N1. Uh, I was on the National Science Advisory Board in 2012 when researchers brought to the board the fact that we were probably only one mutation away from H5N1 becoming the next pandemic virus. Uh, I was part of a major effort to lead an investigation in 2015 with the major bird die off in North America. So I've been eating, sleeping, and living H5N1 for literally since 1997. Having said that, this virus has continued, continued to make us concerned and then make us unconcerned. And when I say make us unconcerned, I don't mean it's gone away, but every day, you know, we are not on the precipice of a new pandemic. When you look at what's happened, there's been 868 cases of confirmed H5N1 globally since uh, basically the 1997 time period. Of those, uh, all over half have died. It's a very, very serious disease. But if you look at it, I mean, countries like Indonesia and Egypt had major increases in cases over the course of this time period, most of them uh, five to seven years ago. At one time, we had over 105 cases in a year in the Nile River Valley in Egypt. Everybody said, it's ready to go. It's going to happen. And so I think we have to be very careful here. I've seen a lot of hype for lack of a better way to describe it, over the past several weeks around H5N1 because of this uh, mink farm infection in, in Spain. And I don't want to suggest that that's not important or all of the other animals that are now becoming infected outside of avian species. And surely we've had another bad year here in North America with 58 million birds 
uh, dying or being called out this year versus uh, what we saw in 2015 with 52 million. And so I want to add, though, a sense of we've been here before with this virus multiple times. And for some reason, it has not just made the jump where it could be transmitted human to human. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. but like some, I don't think it means it's absolutely going to happen tomorrow. And I think we have to be careful. But it's a reminder that it could happen tomorrow. Right. Well, and therefore, that... all of this work we're talking about that needs to be done really is very, very timely. And we could have another 1918-like influenza pandemic that would be so much more severe than England's experience with this right. current pandemic. Those lethality numbers are so high, 46% or whatever, I think I read. I wonder how, how it really spreads, um, what, what, the, what the point is in terms of, of, of the spread on that. But I, I do want to hear from you on uh, why vaccine development for avian flu is more challenging than what we've seen uh, with the development of the uh, mRNA vaccines for COVID. Maybe you could enlighten us on that particular. Yeah, well, if you look at the human vaccines, let's say that, and then I'll talk about the animal vaccines for a moment. Um, when you look at human vaccines, just take a step back and go to 2009. Remember when we were already living in a world with H1N1 as seasonal flu. And then along comes this new pandemic H1N1 from Mexico. And we learned very quickly that the old vaccine that we currently use, we're using seasonally had virtually no protection against the new H1N1, even though they're, they're the very same. You know, they were come from that same HN combination. And one of the challenges we have is, is that even if we make H5N1 vaccines now, and which there's not much appetite surely to do that or stockpile them, we'd have no guarantee that when H5N1 emerged, that in fact, it, the vaccines we had already right. made would be protective against it. And so it might, they might provide some protection, but they won't uh, necessarily provide that much. And 2009 makes that point. I think the other thing is, is that when you have a vaccine like this, you know, it has an outdating problem where, you know, it's only good for so long and how long can you keep it? And so, uh, you know, buying five, 10 million doses of the vaccine may seem like a wise idea for at least the early part of the pandemic, but five to 10 million doesn't get you very far in a population of 8 billion. And the cost of trying to supply a much larger volume of vaccine is so, so high that I don't think it's gonna be done. Okay. So for me, the real answer is, in how can you scale up quickly a scalable vaccine program that as Margaret, you talked about getting it out there and having that infrastructure in place allows you to do that. And that's not necessarily easy to do, because remember, right now, we primarily grow all of our influenza vaccine in, in eggs, chicken eggs, which, well, one of the things we have to be worried about, and when we have those chickens around, or will they too be, if there's an avian influenza situation, what will happen to them? So that's a concern. The second issue around the birds, we've heard a lot about vaccination of birds themselves, particularly the poultry, uh, in many parts of the world. But these vaccines are very, very difficult. Unlike standard vaccines we use in, in poultry production today, uh, such as Newcastle and so forth, they're stable vaccines that can be given in water in the air. Here, basically, you have to individually inoculate each bird with an unstable vaccine that needs to likely be changed every year. And there are 9 billion broilers, the chickens we eat, produced in the United States every year. You know what that means to try to hand vaccinate each one of those? And so it's not as practical as some of the recent media reports suggest. Let's just vaccinate the animals. And so, again, another challenge that we have to deal with. But it's one that, you know, as I said earlier, pay me now or pay me later. Michael, let me just get one last question in before we close about masks, because sure. there have been some flawed studies about uh, masks. And I want to know uh, the efficacy of, of wearing a, a KN95 or a respirator. And then maybe yeah. uh, just tell us, is the 15 minute rule still something that's operative? Yeah. Take the mask first. You know, I just have to say, and you may want to cut this, I hope you don't, but you know what? One of the reasons I love coming on this program is I've never, never deal with two more informed interviewers than the two of you. <laughs> you are always curt, <laughs> comprehensive, and authoritative. <laughs> and in this case, you're absolutely right about the issue around respiratory protection. Studies that have recently come out, including the Cochrane reviews, 
are seriously flawed in their understanding of how to evaluate respiratory protection. Suffice it to say from the occupational area, there is no question that we've already answered the question about do you need to have that fit and filtration combination to keep out aerosols? And we've learned, unfortunately, through this pandemic, the absolute importance of aerosol transmission with this virus. Yeah. So, yes, you do need to have that. And, you know, one of the ideals is to have everybody face fitted, but we don't even need to do that. We can get quite good protection with fit. Remember, procedure masks leak all over because there's nothing that's tight around the face. Uh, also, again, to breathe air in a tight environment like that, you have to have a material that air can move through relatively easily. Why does that work with an N95? Because they have an electrostatic charge in the material so that air can move and the virus gets trapped, not because it's plugged up or stopped, but because it gets trapped by the electrostatic charge. If you put any other kind of mask on, that won't work. And so I think it's so important to understand that you know, a lot of people are wearing what they think is adequate respiratory protection and procedure masks, cloth masks, and they're just simply not. And I, I, I find it really very challenging because they think they're doing the right thing, and yet they're still just as vulnerable. The 15-minute issue, Mark, that worked earlier with the previous uh, strains of the, uh, or variants of the virus, but as we've got these much more highly infectious variants, what we've just seen in China in the last two months has been transmission that puts us on the upper end of measles transmission. That is aerosol, aerosol, wow. aerosol. And it's clear that we have to have that kind of respiratory protection or basically more cosmetic what you're doing. Well, Michael, you just gave us a whole lot to think about and perhaps get you back for at other visits soon with those with those last comments. But we want to thank you so much thank for you. this return visit to our program. We always appreciate your insights and your information. And thank you to our audience for being here. There's more online about conversations on healthcare, including a way to sign up for email updates. The web address is chcradio.com. Michael, thank you so much for thank your you. incredibly important work and for Absolutely. being with us today again. Thank you.